Let me begin by welcoming all of you to our country and uh, thank you especially for these uh, wonderful <coughs> greetings uh, from India, a country that has uh, provided me with a new sense of the human spirit where the, uh, the excellence as well as the, uh, the struggle of humanity can be displayed uh, anywhere you go, whether it is in a poor village or in a, in a big city. So to be reminded of India here this morning is indeed a, a very profound, uh, very profound message. Uh, let me also say that looking around the world, how India has managed, despite all the challenges and difficulties, to remain a democratic country since the foundation of the Republic, is I think one of the most remarkable manifestations of how the human spirit can aim uh, for a new world. And for us in Iceland, to be associated with India in this way, we sometimes say we are the oldest democracy in the world. That can perhaps be doubted, but we like to say it. <laughs> But India is definitely the largest democracy in the world, nobody can doubt that. So to link Iceland and India in this way is uh, a brilliant idea. Let me also welcome our... I need an interpretation of it. <laughs> I, I, I know my Indian friends always like when you praise India. <laughs> but, uh, but I will also say to my Icelandic friends, and it's a kind of internal Icelandic joke, and I apologize for the, uh, to the foreign guests, that uh, when somebody travels from India in such a high age, uh, provides that you can still go strong, it gives me a thought what I should do in the coming years and decades <laughs> uh, as well. But let me also welcome our friend, uh, Her Royal Highness. Uh, it's uh, indeed a great pleasure to have you finally here in Iceland. More than a thousand years after the first Norwegians came to Iceland. It's taken you a long time, but we are very pleased to uh, uh, have, you here, uh, have you here with us. And for all of you who have come from different countries to Iceland, I hope those days will be a time of uh, inspirations and new visions and, and reflections of, on uh, what can be done. It is uh, difficult to try to explain Iceland in a short time, but perhaps an important key is to uh, read the opening uh, of the uh, Old Testament, uh, book of Genesis, where it is described how the Almighty created the earth in six days and decided uh, to rest after that because, uh, as the Holy Book says, the work was finished. But by arriving in Iceland, you realize that that's not entirely true. <laughs> that at least in this instance, the Holy Book is not entirely correct because uh, the creation has continued in this country uh, until this very day and will continue in this way with uh, new volcanic eruptions and new islands and earthquakes and uh, lava fields and this all extraordinary display that we are not yet the masters of the universe, that there are still forces of nature stronger than ourselves. And we were reminded of that uh, recently in this country, as you all know. And it is exactly this relationship between humanity and Mother Earth derive a certain arrogance from the technological and scientific achievements that uh, we uh, celebrate uh, in, our, in our daily lives. But in this country we are reminded every day, sometimes every hour, that we are not yet and never will be the masters of the universe. It is a, a humbling experience, and it is an important message to carry, to carry with us. And in this splendid building, 
you can uh, see that combination. I am often asked, uh, what did Iceland do after the bank's collapse and during the financial crisis? You can give a long lecture in answer to the question, but you can also answer it in one sentence. We built a concert hall. Uh, we, uh, we reset the compass in this uh, splendid way, and we did more. We surrounded this concert hall with the largest piece of art you can find anywhere in the world, created by Oliver Eliasson, who, by the way, also had a role at the new opera house uh, in Oslo, where he combined with glass and steel this extraordinary way for us to uh, see outside this building as we leave our discussions on dialogue and are reminded once again of the mountains and the oceans and the forces uh, of nature. And it is a piece of art that only one company in the world could construct. And that company was found in China. So this building is also a reminder how the world has changed in a fundamental way because it is probably the only cultural building in the Western world where China has had a major contribution to its, uh, to its construction. So, reflecting on can we reset the compass? Can we indeed do new things? Can we create a new landscape of possibilities, which are the topics of this session here this morning? This very building proves that it can be done, that the compass can in fact be reset in a profound way with the combination of, of culture and vision and daring, and also not to give up despite the uh, profound, profound challenges. But let me also here this morning, in a few minutes, share with you five other examples of how Iceland in many ways demonstrates that indeed we can reset the conflict. We can enter new landscapes and achieve what almost everybody thought impossible. And I think in an international dialogue where there are so many voices telling us what we cannot do, that it is impossible to change, that we must continue in the way that we have done for so long. It is very important to uh, let the concrete examples of profound transformation inspire us uh, to go ahead. You come to this modern city with this extraordinary building. But two generations ago, Reykjavik was a tiny village of 300 people. There was no town in this country, definitely not a city. And there was only one school, only one school. And when I receive you tomorrow at the residence at the reception, you will be able to see that small building where the school was housed. There were about 50,000 people in Iceland spread over this large country the size of England, poor farmers and fishermen. All the powers were in the hands of the Danish king. We had no human rights in the modern sense of the world. Not economic, judicial, environmental, or even economic. And through the lifetime of only two generations, we have seen this extraordinary transformation of a nation which most people believe was too small and faced too many challenges to be able to achieve independence and definitely not to be able to create one of the most advanced modern societies in the world. It is a proof that almost any community in the world, wherever it is, however small, and from wherever meager beginnings, can indeed transform itself in a fundamental way. And only about a mile or so from this new concert hall is the small house where Reagan and Gorbachev met 25 years ago. Then the Cold War and the military confrontation so dominated the entire world that they could neither read in Russia nor in America. They 
had to meet on a neutral ground in a small house where the room where they had the dialogue was uh, too small for any delegation to enter. And if anybody had predicted at that time that ten years later all of Europe would be democratic, that the Cold War would be over, nobody would have believed it. At that time, our part of the world, the northern regions, the Arctic, was the most militarized area in the world, with military bases ranging from Alaska into Canada and Greenland, here in Iceland, to Norway and even into Russia, with submarines and missiles and military planes. If anybody had predicted that before the 20th century was over, this militarized, probably one of the most militarized regions in the world, would be a territory of peace and cooperation, where the eight Arctic countries, including the new Russia and the United States, cooperate peacefully within the Arctic Council, reaching agreements of constructions and cooperation. Nobody would have believed it. And for more than half a century, the United States maintained a military base in our country. It was one of the key aspects of the military buildup in the North Atlantic. And many generations of Icelanders spent their entire political life in disputes and hot arguments about this military base. And during the early political youth of Ingrid Bergsorun and myself, it was one of the core issues of Icelandic politics. If anybody had said in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s, even in the 90s, that the Americans would leave, the base would be empty of soldiers, and instead of the military barracks, there would be a university, a film studio, a workshop of artists and innovators, nobody would have believed it. And you might not realize it, but I want to point it out to you that for the last six years, there has not been a single soldier in this country, not one. We have managed to conduct our affairs, to go through one of the most profound financial crises uh, we have ever experienced, a major volcanic eruptions that uh, got the world's attention, receive every year more than half a million visitors from all over the world, conduct an open, free and democratic and advanced and progressive society without a single military figure. Not a single person bearing arms in the sense that people think essential for modern societies. So your presence here is perhaps from any of the first experience where you are in a society without a single soldier. Political vision is dominated by the fact that every problem, every conflict has to somehow to have a military dimension. That it is impossible to be human beings and cooperate without somebody having the responsibility to bear arms. Or to put it differently, without somebody having the legal right to kill other people. There are, of course, Many other examples I could mention this morning. The financial crisis was mentioned, not just by me, but also by others here uh, this morning. We can talk about that for a long time. But it brought home to us here in Iceland a very important historical crossroads, where we had to choose what is more important in such times of profound challenge, the democratic will of the people, or the financial interests of the market. And we were forced to choose. And the people of Iceland, farmers and fishermen and teachers and nurses said, we want to decide. We want to exercise our democratic will. We are not willing to accept that the profound interest of the financial institutions are superior to the democratic will of ordinary people. So we had two referendums in this country, and three years later, we are the most profound example of economic recovery, and I believe partly because we let the democratic will of the people 
point towards the new direction. Let me conclude by the following. Iceland is the home of the largest glaciers in Europe. Our neighboring country, Greenland, has one of the greatest ice mass in the world. When we talk about the future of humanity and the future of Mother Earth, we tend to forget that we live in an ice-dependent world. And what happens to the glaciers in Iceland and Greenland, to the glaciers in the Himalayas that are the resources of the great rivers of India and China, and what happens in Antarctica will have a more profound impact on our future, on our civilization, on humanity, and perhaps any other event in the life of our children and our grandchildren. And we are all responsible. You can't find a single human being on Mother Earth which has not contributed in one way or another to uh, climate change. We cannot put that responsibility on others. It is ours. And it brings home this profound interlinkage between humanity and Mother Nature. And here in Iceland, we are also reminded it doesn't necessarily have to be so. Because it is a country which has transformed itself from being, in my youth, over 80% dependent on imported oil and coal. And now, 100% of our electricity and our space heating comes from clean energy. And if we can get enough electric cars in the coming years or so, we can truly become the first country in the world where all land-based activity is derived from clean energy. I don't believe it can only be done in Iceland. I think it shows that we can indeed reset the compass. We can aim for a new landscape of possibility. But we also must do that. Because I believe there is no stronger moral responsibility for anyone than to work together to prevent the continuous melting of the glaciers, to prevent the uh, disappearance of the ice, and to enable our children and grandchildren to enjoy Mother Earth within the spirit of humanity, as we have thought was our birthright and our privilege. And with those thoughts, I welcome you again to our country. I hope this small island will give you inspiration and thought, and I'm looking forward to welcoming you all uh, tomorrow afternoon after uh, a very fruitful dialogue that you are going to have in the next two days. Thank you.